perspectives bring to the development of knowledge societies. What is at stake in this set of discussions is profound. In an age of pervasive globalization, access to excellent institutions of higher education is the one consistent fulcrum for personal and societal growth and development. The one constant in the support of democratic institutions the best indicator of economic stability and growth and the necessary infrastructure for rule of law. A higher education system focused on global engagement, knowledge production, and liberal education produces a citizenry broadly educated to think critically and carefully about and participate meaningfully in its governance, its science, its traditions, its arts, and its culture. To find such opportunities to develop their own human capital to the fullest, faculty and students with the resources to do so migrate to centers of excellence in education at an astonishing rate. According to the United Nations, 4.1 million students are enrolled in institutions of higher education outside their countries of citizenship, a five-fold increase since 1975. Higher education institutions that consistently focus on both the transmission of received wisdom and on the development of new knowledge that provide the tools for that development, the libraries, the laboratories, and the technology, and the support for collaboration among the best minds, whatever the discipline, are drawing their students and faculty from around the world without regard to national borders. Knowledge is not a zero-sum game. No single system of higher education has all the answers for knowledge de development. Historically, though, countries that do best in this global environment have developed a rich ecosystem of diverse institutions of higher education, from generalized vocational education through to the highest levels of excellent research. Both public and private institutions that provide opportunities and pathways for the development of the human capital needed to staff and sustain their different missions pathways for the development of excellent faculty and excellent students. They focus on faculty excellence as measured through the transformation of individual student lives, the creation and testing of new ideas, and the impact of those ideas on the societies in which they are located, and indeed on the globe. And they are supported financially by every sector of the society, including both the government, which can help direct resource and research toward the most pressing national goals, and the private sector, which can move private wealth towards the creation of educational excellence. Indeed, I would argue with humility that among the sources of financial sustainability for higher education in the United States, private philanthropy has been the greatest engine for educational excellence because it has provided funding to focus on exactly that. I note with appreciation the growing culture of private philanthropy in higher education in India, most immediately expressed by the commitments made by Chancellor Naveen Jindal to this university.
which are already making an enormous intellectual contribution to the ecosystem of higher education in India. The pervasive globalization in higher education brings increasing opportunities to collaborate and to bring the best of our systems to each other. Joint partnerships for research, some funded through the Obama Sinjin Initiative and many funded privately. The increasing availability of technology that brings faculty and students together in classrooms around the world. The importance of student and faculty exchanges that permit, for instance, far diff different and distant institutions to engage directly with each other and to build the relationships that lead to knowledge partnerships. All of these open doors for sharing our best practices. For instance, the OP Jindal University has been founded on the creation of these relationships and partnerships around the globe, a long-term investment in human capital that will be truly evident only decades from now. And while my own Indiana University is honored to have many educational partners in India and to host almost a thousand students from India at our campuses, we recently opened a facility in Delhi to allow us to bring students from the United States in much greater numbers here so that they may engage directly with the beauty, the traditions, and the intellectual richness of India. In conclusion, I thank our host for the invitation to learn from the discussions of the next few days and for the profound opportunity for my institution and other institutions from my country to be partners in the exciting future India is building. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Robel, for the keynote address. I now have the honor to request our guest, Sri Pallam Raju, Union Minister of Human Resource Development to deliver his address. Respected Rashtrapati Ji, Sri Pradam Mukherjee, Excellency Governor of Haryana, Jagannath Pahadia Ji, Respected Chief Minister of Haryana, Bupindra Huda Ji, Provost of the Indiana University, Ms. Lauren Rubel, Chancellor of the University and my colleague in the Lok Sabha, Navin Jindal, Srimati Savitri Jindalji, Vice Chancellor Raj Kumar, Speaker of the Haryana Assembly, Member of Parliament of Sonipat, distinguished guests in the audience, judges, excellencies, academicians, deans, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to be here for the inaugural session of the International Conference on the Future of Indian Universities. And at the outset, I must applaud uh, Sri Navin Jindal for the noble initiative of starting this world-class university in memory of his late father, Sri O.P. Jindal. And not only is it a great initiative in terms of an academic uh, initiative, but I think in terms of a philanthropic initiative as a non-profitable university. I think it's a great uh, gesture on his part and, the, uh, and on the part of his family. I understand that uh, this university is one of the few universities in Asia that maintains a faculty to student ratio of 1 is to 15, which is a very important factor in determining global standards. And I also appreciate the fact that he maintains a global faculty which is an important factor in the ratings of universities. Higher education is a crucial component of India's growth story today. The demographic dividend provides India great opportunities but also great challenges. We will be able to reap the benefits of such a dividend only if our population is healthy, educated and skilled. 
from just over 28 universities and 578 colleges in 1950, we have come a long way today with about 680 universities and 33,000 colleges all over the country and with the largest number of higher education institutions with around 20 million students all over the country. Despite all the progress made in higher education, India faces challenges in areas of access, equity and quality. Providing quality and affordable education to a large growing population of youth is one of our biggest challenges. The youth of our country have huge aspirations and see education as an opportunity to prosperity. If you look at the factor of equity, our GR in higher education is around 80%, 18%, whereas the world average is around 23%. We aim to increase our GR to about 30% by the year 2020. There is also a wide disparity across urban and rural areas. If you look at the FICI report, the GER in urban areas is about 23.8, while in rural areas is just about 7.5%. Again, to give, you, to give you another example, the GER in Delhi is about 31.9%, while in Assam it's about 8.3%. So there is a need to bridge this divide. Quality is a major concern. On one hand, we need to bring many of our youth into higher education fold. And on the other hand, we have to focus on improving quality and global competitiveness. Over the years, the Indian economy has led to a huge demand for educated and skilled labor. To meet the manpower needs, private institutions have cropped up to complement the government educational institutions. In fact, over the years, the private sector has driven the capacity creation in Indian higher education sector. In order to ensure equity and access, and at the same time to improve quality and excellence in institutions of higher learning, the government has realized the need to put in place a proper regulatory and facilitating policy framework. Several legislative initiatives have been taken by the Ministry of Human Resource Development, and some of these have been introduced in Parliament. It is our sincere hope that we would be able to pass these bills which would be the enabling factors for the quality factor in higher education today. There is a need to bring in research, innovation and industry partnerships into our universities today. If you look at the latest figures today, for the fifth consecutive year, India has slipped in its manufacturing abilities. We pride ourselves as a services nation, but I think there is a strong case for picking up our competencies in manufacturing. A recent report has also indicated about how we, our electronic expo imports amount to about $42 billion and are likely to rise to about $65 billion by the year 2015 and only 35% of it is manufactured out of India. If you look at competencies elsewhere, 21 of the top 25 silicon companies have their R&D establishments out of India. And all the intellectual output that is happening out of India becomes the IPR of these multinationals. As pointed out by speakers who, who have spoken before me, none of our institutions of excellence figure in the global rankings, whereas China, South Korea and Singapore figure in the list. This is something that has to be pondered about and I think there are several fronts on which our higher education has to definitely work. We have to treat universities and research in, in institutes as engines of growth and increase spending on our R&D. Today, our R&D spend as a nation is a little less than 1%. And I think there is a strong case for increasing the spend on R&D. Private industries need to be encouraged to have substantive collaboration with universities. 
If you look to the future, digital technologies and innovations have disrupted many established industries. Digital technologies in future will transform the way education is delivered and supported. And this is what our higher education has to be geared up for. I wouldn't want to take more time as I'm sure that everybody is eagerly awaiting the President's speech. I thank the Jindal University for this opportunity and may this institution rise to greater heights. Thank you and Jai Hind. Thank you very much, uh, Sri Pallam Raju, for your address. I now request Sri Bhutundar Singh Huda, the Chief Minister of Haryana, to deliver his address. Respected President of India, Sri Pandam Mukherjee, Respected Governor of Haryana, Sri Jagannath Padiyaji, Honorable Union Minister for Human Resources and Development, my friend, Sri M. M. Pallam Raju, Honorable Speaker of Haryana Assembly, Sri Kuldeep Sharmaji, Honorable Member of Parliament from Sonipat, Sri Jitendar Maliki, Honorable Member of Legislature, Haryana Legislature, Srimati O.P. Jindalji, Mrs. Naveen Jindal, Member of Parliament and Chancellor of O.P. Jindal Global University, Sri Naveen Jindalji, Professor Lauren Robal, Provost in Diana University, USA, Vice Chancellor JGU Professor Sri Rajkumar, Registrar JGU Professor YSR Murthy, dear students and distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is a matter of great pride for me to welcome Honorable President of India to Haryana. I also extend a warm welcome to all other guests who have graced the occasion. I commend the initiative of Shri, uh, the initiative of OP Jindal Global University for organizing this conference. The subject matter of the conference is extremely relevant at this stage of development when educational frontiers are expanding in India at an uh, unprecedented speed. The learned participants present here Today we will enlighten us on various aspects of university education in India. We are already in the second decade of 21st century. This century is going to be known as a knowledge century. As Francis Bacon said, knowledge is power. In the years to come, only those economies and societies will move forward which are able to promote higher learning and knowledge pool. We as a nation have done good deal to move forward in expanding educational facilities, but we have a long way to go. As a matter of fact, we are still struggling with the basic education outreach. <coughs> the West continues to dominate the league tables of top universities. Even now, the United States of America and United Kingdom possesses the world's best university. They attract some of the finest academicians and scholars from around the world. It is a matter of concern, as Mr. Pallam was also telling, it is, a real, it is a really a matter of concern that in the top 200 universities of the world, not even a single university from India figures in the list. It is primarily for this reason that our budding talent prefer to go abroad for higher studies. This is a daunting challenge before all of us. We need to invest in our universities in a big way so that some of them may match up the best in the world. Now China is emerging very fast as a parallel center of top level higher education. So like all other fields, we have a tough competition right in our neighborhood. While we plan to transform our higher education into knowledge-based learning. We need to improve our institutions both in terms of physical facilities and quality of teaching. In my view, beginning has to be made at the school education level itself. More than anything else, we have to encourage our youth to take to science, sciences, mathematics and English language. 
Apart from learning physical sciences, we need to inculcate scientific temper in our younger generation. If we are able to provide opportunities to our young boys and girls for quality education at school level, there will be enough talent to feed our universities as well. I believe that both levels have to be addressed simultaneously. While we transform our school education, we invest in improving college and university education so that the transition from quality education quality school education to higher level is along the expected lines but this is a but this is easier said than done it needs huge investment in public sector institutions but that alone will not be enough the private sector has to participate in a big way in supplementing the efforts of the government as a matter of fact the world over various trusts and foundations have been responsible for setting up some of the top level educational institutions. There is no reason why we should not be able to do this in, in India. Already some modest beginnings have been made. OP Jindal Global University is a shining example of such an initiative. Other corporates house are also expected to follow suit. Honorable President Sir, ever since 2005, Haryana government has been investing in quality education in a big way. Close, close to the campus of the OP Jindal Global University, we have set up an ambitious project known as the Rajiv Gandhi Education City. We have acquired about 2,000 acres 